killer whales are powerful icons of the Pacific Northwest. To the Salish Sea's Lummi Nation, their Quilhold Maken are relatives under the waves. To all of us, they symbolize freedom, family, and strength. But we've allowed the killer whale population known as the Southern Residents to become critically endangered with fewer than 75 remaining. Now we all have a role in trying to save them. Fishers, farmers, forestry folks, power companies, and policymakers, activists, whale watchers, and everyday citizens. There's plenty of work for everyone to do. Effective action must be backed by solid science. At CDOC, we're wildlife veterinarians and researchers. So together with our conservation partners, we're deploying every scientific tool available to prevent these magnificent animals from going extinct. This is Infrared Joe Gatos of the Sea Doc Society. On this expedition, we're using high-tech gear to study the health of killer whales. Let's get, get to, to work. work. We set out in an open boat crammed to the gunnels with a whole pod of orca experts. The urgency of the southern residents' decline makes it necessary for us to view these wild animals the same way medical doctors see their human patients. This kind of intense conservation approach has been effective for species like the mountain gorillas cared for by our sister organization, Gorilla Doctors. Gorilla Docs treat animals in the wild for snare wounds, respiratory diseases, and other life-threatening conditions. These veterinary interventions alone have been responsible for 40% of the growth in this critically endangered population. Free-swimming killer whales pose different challenges than gorillas in the forest. But our goal is the same. Track the animal's health and be prepared to act if we discover a serious problem we can treat. This came into focus for us back in 2018 when a young J-pod orca named Scarlet looked seriously ill. Scarlet had been an exuberant calf. She was an instant favorite with everyone who saw her. But the summer after she turned three, Scarlet got sick. She lost so much weight that you could see the outline of her skull a bad sign for orcas, who normally have a thick layer of fat behind their heads. Since young females like Scarlet are the only chance to produce the southern resident babies of the future, Noah took the unprecedented step of authorizing the first ever medical treatment of a wild killer whale. CDOC and the Vancouver Aquarium were part of an international team that successfully dosed Scarlet with antibiotics for secondary infections. But sadly, she passed away before we could figure out what was making her so sick in the first place. With Scarlet's memory as inspiration, we're determined not only to work on ecosystem-wide recovery, but also to advance our ability to diagnose and potentially treat sick, endangered killer whales. Because we're pioneering new research methods, our federal permit allows us to approach both types of killer whales seen in the Salish Sea, residents and the mammal-eating bigs. We have lots of tech on board, but we start out the old-fashioned way. Just like your family doctor is trained to observe you, even before asking about symptoms, we first note the overall well-being of the orcas. We watch their behavior. How are they acting? Are they swimming, surfacing, and socializing normally? We count respiration rates and time their dives during different activity levels to gather baseline data. As we move closer, we check skin color and texture for signs of injury or disease. So did you see the little guy's skin? Yeah, white, white. Yeah, white patches. Yeah. High resolution photos and videos let us compare these observations with past and future sightings. That helps us understand if the skin issues we see are temporary and benign, like rashes or teenage acne, or if they could be a sign of something more serious. J16, J26. We know these animals as individuals, and every observation we make adds to their yeah. medical history. I'm seeing seven individuals. Over the years, researchers have maintained a family photo album of all the killer whales that visit the Salish Sea. Each one can be identified by their saddle patch markings combined with the outline of their dorsal fins. 
The first new piece of gear we deploy is a special camera that can see infrared energy and carbon dioxide. Healthy orca's bodies are covered in blubber three to four inches thick. They carry less of this insulation on their fins and flukes, which helps them regulate their internal temperature. On the infrared spectrum, a whale's skin shows up cool blue over the body and displays warmer colors on the fins and around the blowhole. Those areas really start to glow after the orcas have been working hard chasing prey. Ooh, that dorsal fin was hot on that one. These temperatures look pretty normal for their activity levels. If we saw any unexpected hot spots, they could be signs of infection or injury. The camera CO2 detector also helps us to observe the whale's blows. When breathing normally, humans exchange about 12% of our lung volume. During an orca's short, sharp breaths, they can exchange up to 85%. These big boys and girls are pushing a lot of air. We're hoping that we can measure the tidal volume and ejection rate of the exhalation as a field test for pulmonary function. Because they live so close to human development, southern resident killer whales are exposed to the same air pollution we are from industry, engine exhaust, and wildfires. Their sea is also covered by a thin film of microbes. A whale with a healthy immune system coexists with this bacterial or viral soup. But if they're ill or malnourished, they can suffer from primary or secondary pneumonia and other respiratory diseases. We're also employing a directional microphone to record the acoustic signatures of the blows. This acts as our long distance version of a stethoscope. By digitally recording audio and video of their blow volume and sounds, and even by noting how the orca's breath smells, we add more data to each animal's chart. Like with body condition, differences over time could let us know when a whale is sick. Our next step is to get better at diagnosing killer whale illnesses and determining whether we can help. For that, just like your MD, we need to get some samples. Doctors love to examine anything that oozes out of the patient's bodies. Spit, snot, phlegm, pee, poop. The more disgusting, the better. While following behind these killer whales, we carefully watch for the stuff that exits their behinds. So yeah, I'll poop. You got poop dead ahead. Between NOAA Fisheries Dr. Brad Hansen, SeaWorld's Dr. Chris Dold, San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance's Dr. Hendrick Nolans, and me, we got a gang of geeks with a whole wall full of degrees who are absolutely stoked over seeing whale poop. Us orca dorks call this doing our due diligence. I once heard Joe call it endangered feces. <laughs> Drones are now being used to collect several health metrics for killer whales. One is photogrammetry, where researchers take precise measurements from aerial pictures to gauge body condition. Like us, healthy orcas can be pleasantly plump or relatively lean, and that can change throughout the year. But by comparing photos of an individual whale over time, and also by looking at the body condition compared to their pod mates, scientists can tell if they might be unusually thin. Photogrammetry can even be used to keep track of orca pregnancies and the growth rate of calves. Just like their digestive systems, killer whales' lungs also support a complex community of microbes. To sample those, we launch a smaller drone that's fitted with a 3D printed petri dish carrier. The whale blows and our expert pilots swoop in with pinpoint accuracy after the whale goes back under. Got some! We know orcas are very intelligent, but this adolescent bigs male, T37B1, nicknamed Lance, psychs out our breast sampling team by surfacing upside down. Not just once, but three times in a row. You did it again! Are you recording? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should add a new section for their charts. Sense of humor? Check. Oh yeah, let it rain. Yeah. <laughs> At the lab, pathologists will centrifuge and extract and smear. They'll scope and run spectrometers and chromatograph. Bacteria and fungus will be cultured, antigens and antibodies identified, abnormal cells spotted, hormones, proteins and metabolites measured, DNA sequenced and analyzed. This is the kind of work that puts the doc in CDOC. 
One day, we may be monitoring a female orca that looks thin and ill like Scarlet did. We might hear back from the lab that she's positive for bacterial pneumonia and that her immune system is so compromised that she's got a secondary fungal infection and intestinal parasites. We hope it never comes to this, but the work we're doing now means we'll be better equipped to respond if it's decided that she'll die without medical intervention. In that case, a team could launch to dose her with targeted antibiotics, antifungals, and antiparasite medication. With the Southern resident so precarious, if we can save one life, we could help keep the entire population from disappearing forever. While the drones are up, we use their cameras along with boat-based video to observe whether our presence is bothering the orca's drain sampling. The whole concept of this cutting-edge veterinary work is to non-invasively track their health without needing to dart them with tags or take biopsies which could harm an already weakened animal. Some of the orcas do spot the drone, and of course, they can hear and sense every boat anywhere around them. But judging by their behavior, we don't seem to be stressing them. In fact, several of them are interested in examining us. Maybe these are the scientists of the killer whale world. And maybe they're concerned about our health, because we're out here dangling off tiny boats, obsessed with their droppings. <laughs>